need answer regarding a specific slide. So we are very pleased today to welcome Dr. Angelo Trudan, who kindly accepted our invitation to talk about the bone, its physiology, its morphology, and about GBR. Dr. Trudan is specialized in cranio maxillofacial surgery, oral surgery, and dentistry. And he is currently the president of the International Academy of Ultrasound Surgery and the head of the Center for Facial Aesthetics in Vienna, Austria. So Dr. Trudan, thank you very much for being with us today. And as we are very eager to listen to, to your lecture, I will, without further ado, hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, dear Rachel, for this nice um, introduction of my person. Um, first of all, I welcome everybody to this webinar. And <clears throat> it's going to be a very, very compact webinar on uh, basics in bone morphology, physiology, and GBR. And I had the great honor to meet the inventor of this fantastic uh, bone graph material we, were spe we will be speaking today. Uh, it's Dr. Kudrow Führ from Switzerland. And uh, this is why I'm also, since 2007, in the advisory board and in, in, in the biomaterial experts group that um, tries to uh, still improve this material in the course of time. So, but first, before we start in the uh, specific issues, I just want to remind you that, of course, especially in biology, we are the result of millions of years of evolution. And what you can see here is simply the fact that um, form follows function. What does this mean? Um, the reason why we have teeth is simply that we need to eat. Of course, as humans, we need also to speak, we need it for pronunciation, but basically teeth were made just to eat and to uh, gnaw on all types of, of um, food material and to digest it. So, I told you before, form follows function. You always have to ask yourself, why does a certain face looks as it looks? For instance, why do cats or the predator monkeys have such a long uh, jaw? Simply because they need a rest for their canines because they don't eat cooked meat like we do, or let's say they are not omnivores, but they are pure meat eater. And this is why they need a very, very strong and very long bone for the roots to be anchored to the bone, to be able to uh, bite into their victims and then to tear them apart. In the course of evolution, of course, here you see the chimpanzee, uh, of course, the chimpanzees are multivores. That means they eat also uh, berries, uh, nuts, etc., etc. They don't live on meat anymore. So this is why uh, the entire meat phase got a trophy. Of course, this doesn't count for the shark, but this is a different story. So the take-home message from this very, very short introductory is simply, why do we have a certain aspect of our skull bones. It's simply to sustain the forces introduced by teeth and in course of the implantology by implants into the best possible biomechanical stable bone. This is the reason why we are here and this is why we have to understand how bone works and that not everything is possible with bone. So the next question we have to ask ourselves Simply, what is bone? The answer is very, very simple. The histology of woven bone, which uh, the entire facial skull bone are composed of, it's a composite. It's not a single organ. It's a composite of a basic fabric of collagen fibers. This is the very base of bone, and which are then later on mineralized. That means hardened by hydroxyapatite. And the microstructure of bone is simply, you have the periosteum, which covers every small trabecula of the woven bone structure and also of the compact bone. Then you have some blood vessels and 
the periosteum contains the osteoblasts, and they are responsible for mineralizing the bone. This is extremely important to understand. This is why we need so much the periosteum for bone regeneration. So, as a take-home message, the jaw bones basic fabric are collagenous fibers, like in every organ in the human body. Lungs, liver, brain, they all consist basically of collagenous fibers. In case of the bone, these collagenous fibers are mineralized by the periosteum and the endosteum to sustain the bending forces which are introduced into the bone by chewing. That's a simple fact, and this is how evolution made our bones. So the next biological question is, of course, how does bone heal or regenerate? Um, you always see in the, um, in the bottom the references. So uh, since this lecture will be available for free on our Academy's channel, you can then later on look it up because these are the most important references that you absolutely should read to understand how bone works. So how do we apply this knowledge in dentistry? Let's take the physiology of the extraction socket healing. We all know when we extract a tooth, we have a certain amount of bleeding. Sometimes it's a little bit more bleeding, sometimes less. In case there is no bleeding at all, we have a necrosis of the adjacent bone in the extraction socket. We call this the so-called dry socket syndrome. What happens? The patient after extraction goes home, comes the next day and tells you, I have so much pain here. You take a look inside the oral cavity, you take a look at the extraction site. What you see is something blackish because there was no uh, hematoma formation because of lack of bleeding, maybe due to overheating of the bone, maybe due to applying too much adrenaline to the side, or maybe the patient has some kind of, of uh, disturbance in the uh, blood flow in this uh, special area. But what do we need this blood clot for? It's a general medical knowledge. A bone fracture or a bone wound and an extraction socket is a bone wound. Because from the standpoint of the bone, the bone doesn't make a difference if you extract the tooth or if you have an accidental fracture of the bone. And it does not heal without the initial fracture hematoma. Why do we need the hematoma or the blood clot? Or nowadays we always use, or <clears throat> a lot of times we are going to use PRF, platelet-rich platelet fibrin, is simply because you need the blood clot to attract blood vessels to grow in. <clears throat> because there is no organ that can regenerate without the application of oxygen. Because oxygen is the fuel of healing. And of course, uh, we need oxygen in the brain, we need oxygen in all, the, um, in all our organs, but if we have a healing side, we need even more oxygen so that the energy can be delivered to reconstruct the lesion. So in case we have no blood clot, we have no extract, um, attraction of the blood vessel in growth, that means no oxygen to the adjacent bone sites, that means necrosis of the bone, and then the patient will have pain. What we do in these cases is very simple. We do it every day, or hopefully not every day because it shouldn't happen that often. We just scratch the bone until we provoke a bleeding, and since we have a bleeding, suddenly the pain goes away, and the bone can heal. So as a general medical knowledge and another take home message is, you need a stable blood clot. And what is also extremely important is, you need an immobilization of the site you're working in or that has to heal to initiate the vascularization. It's very, very simple terms we use every day, but once it comes to bone regeneration or implantology, we Unfortunately, a lot of times simply forget about these simple facts of bone healing. So another application in dentistry, physiology of extraction socket healing, I try to show you everything on the very, very basic um, activities we are doing every day, extracting a tooth. We don't think about it anymore, but 
we know that after three months, after an extraction of a, of a tooth, we want to insert maybe an implant into the site. So what we have in the first step is the hematoma. The hematoma attracts the blood vessels. The blood vessels deliver the oxygen and then the collagenous fibers start to grow inside the socket. So that means when after some six weeks or eight weeks, you dig into the alveolar, you don't find mineralized bone, but you find collagenous fibers. We call this granulation tissue, but in this case, it's not infected collagenous, collagenous tissue. It's simply the collagenous basic fiber texture of regenerating bone. And only later on, after about eight to 12 weeks, slowly this extraction socket will be secondary mineralized. So once again, general medical knowledge and take home message, the principal base of bone are collagenous fibers. This we always have to keep in mind. A bone wound or a bone fracture does not heal without vascularized callus formation. So this is why after six or eight weeks, when we drill a hole into the bone, mostly we won't find that the extraction site is fully mineralized. We just drill them into collagenous fibers, and this is also dependent on time and on the health state of the patient. Sometimes it takes six to eight weeks until the first mineralization starts. Sometimes it even takes four to five months until we have fully mineralized bone. Um, another important aspect, which we unfortunately forget a lot of times, since um, all our surgeries start with the preparation of a mucoperiosteal flap. And during the preparation, we don't take care about the uh, periosteum. Uh, this is the most important tissue because it's the only tissue that delivers the pre-osteoblast and the osteoblast. And these cell structures and these cells are responsible for the mineralization. So maybe if you destroy the periosteum in a site or the periosteum was already destroyed by a bad inflammation in the site, then of course you will have to wait very long until the bone mineralizes. And sometimes it can happen that you have an extraction site, there is no living periosteum, and then after even half a year, you just dig back into the alveolar and you won't find mineralized tissue, simply collagenous fibers. That means that the periosteum, the activity of the periosteum, which is the mineralization of the bone, didn't take place. So, once again, as a big, big take home message, if you have no periosteum, you will have no bone mineralization. And if you have no bone mineralization, you will have no bone healing in the sense that the bone can withstand the introduced forces by a freshly inserted implant. And once again, these are the most important references to read, to understand why the periosteum is so important. When we speak about sinus lifting, I always hear, okay, sinus lifting, it's a periost-like membrane or something miraculous. No, there is no bone in the entire human body that is not covered with per periosteum they, because the periosteum is the prerequisite of the bone. Once you take away the periosteum from a bone structure, then of course the bone will get atrophic within weeks. And just to prove this also, there are a lot of references. The last one is from um, Professor Berberi in, in Lebanon. It was proven again and again and again, the sinus membrane is simply periosteum because it's covering the bone of the sinus floor. So another very important take home message and general medical knowledge, a bone fracture does not heal without remineralization by osteoblast. And the osteoblasts only derive from the periosteum. So how do we apply now this entire knowledge of the certain steps of bone regeneration in dentistry? Once again, I get back to the physiology of extraction socket healing. So when you extract a tooth, the first and most important part in the healing process is you need a stable blood coagulum. The blood coagulum is responsible for the ingrowth of the blood vessels 
the blood vessels then deliver the oxygen for the fibroblasts that start to build up the collagenous fibers, which you can see here. And then only later on, slowly by slowly, from the periosteum and from the endosteum, there will be the remineralization of the collagenous fibers. And at the end, you will find a healed bone, a resistive bone, a mineralized bone, where you can insert the implants. And once again, it's always important to take a look from the standpoint of the bone. So we speak about different bone augmentation techniques. This is just an example. This is the horizontal cut through a maxilla. And from the standpoint of the bone, it does make no difference if you do a subperiosteal tunnel technique for lateral appositional bone augmentation, which until now we always did with autologous bone blocks and screws, or if you do a sinus lift, because on the outside towards the oral cavity, you have the periosteum, you lift the periosteum either as a subperiosteal tunnel technique or as a mucoperiosteal flap. Hopefully, you don't destroy the periosteum in the course of raising the mucoperiosteal flap. Or if you raise the periosteum inside the sinus cavity, and then you just push some bone graft inside, and at the end, it's covered by periosteum. There will be the, the, the vascular ingrowth of blood vessels. The blood vessels deliver the oxygen to the fibroblasts. The fibroblasts cover all the bone graft material with collagenous fibers. And then slowly in the course of time, and the bigger the augmentation side, the longer it takes, this collagenous fiber structure will be mineralized. That means the bone graft material you're inserting, and it doesn't depend if it's autologous bone, because there is nothing miraculous in autologous bone, I will prove to you later on, is simply that all these materials are also integrated like any other implant, because the bone itself, I mean, all these stories about osteoinductivity, osteoconductivity, I mean, they are just words, but actually from the standpoint of the bone, there is a space, a scaffold, this scaffold is filled with something um, calcified, and in between the granules or the chips of the autologous bone, there is the buildup of the collagenous fiber texture, and then finally at the end, in the course of time, it will be mineralized. That's the whole secret of uh, bone regeneration. It's very simple and very, very easy to understand. So what are the conclusions from this absolute knowledge how bone heals and how bone regenerates. It's very simple. So I just give you an example to give you some view on my work as a maxillofacial surgeon. I'm specialized in traumatology and reconstructive surgery. What you can see here is a um, really bad fracture of the lower leg. So how can we treat fractures like this? The main point is always immobilization. And the bone does not care if you do external immobilization. This is a fixator external, Or if you just put a cast on it, or you do an internal fixation with osteosynthesis plate. This is exactly the same what I do every day in my hospitals. We have a fracture of the jaw. So we use the same little bit smaller titanium plates than on the, uh, on the long bones of the leg but we use titanium plates, we use titanium screws to immobilize the fracture. Of course, here you can see an example. I hope you can see it. Uh, this was just, the you can do an intermaxillary fixation. That means the people cannot open the mouth anymore. So that means the fracture is also immobilized towards the upper teeth. But if you don't do it sufficiently, which is, uh, here, it's just a wire around the two adjacent teeth. This is not an immobilization. So this fracture will never heal. How do we apply this now in maxillofacial surgery and bone reconstruction in bone regeneration and implantology? Once again, you can see here a fracture of the temporomandibular joint. This is repositioned and stabilized with titanium plates. Here you can see a bad fracture of an 
uh, explosion trauma inside the sinus, which sometimes looks quite similar to a sinus lift. But what is so important is you see it on the right, uh, on the right lower side, the same screws or very similar screws that are used in orthopedic surgery, in maxillofacial surgery, traumatology. We use as titanium implants and we apply, if there is a defect, we apply bone graft material to enlarge the scaffold and to make the bone wider in one single step. Because from the standpoint of the bone, it doesn't make any difference if you insert the implant or if you do before you insert the implant, a bone augmentation procedure, or if you do both. Because the most important part in this story is the intact periosteum. This is the simple truth. And the simple truth is the site has to be immobilized. If the site is mobile, like this here, there will be no bone healing. If this site is not immobilized, there will be no bone regeneration. You can do whatever you want to, and there is no um, miracle material that can avoid a failure if you don't immobilize the site. Okay, so we get to the next step. How do we build bone? We call ourselves bone regenerators, the bone builders. And once again, still after years of discussion, um, we ask ourselves, oh, what is the new goal? Or what is the gold standard in bone augmentation procedures? So we have to ask ourselves once again, from the standpoint of the bone, how do bone blocks, implants, and biomaterials regenerate bone and also integrate exactly? So we're speaking about the phys physiology of guided bone regeneration and also integration. The basic biological question, once again, is, is there a difference between autologous bone grafts, xenogenic biomaterials and dental implants in the course of bone regeneration and also integration? And the answers are evidence-based, 100% clear right now. If we speak about autologous bone block uh, transplants or allografts, the answer is simply no. And it's also very easy to understand. As soon as you take out a bone block, for instance, from the chin or from the lateral side of the mandible, you disconnect this bone from the oxygen supply. That means, and this is proven here by Spinetto, it was, it, it, it's one of the most important references that you should really read and especially look at the, at the slides. You can see they made a comparison between autologous bone block transfer uh, transplants, uh, fresh frozen dried bone, and um, um, and um, uh, xenogenous bone grafts. And what you can see in all cases is all these autologous bone blocks are just simply osseointegrated. The pinkish part is the new built bone. And this is necrotic bone parts. So there is no magic about autologous bone blocks. The reason why we use autologous bone blocks, you see on the right side, they are rigid. They are fixed with titanium screws. So what is the prerequisite for proper bone healing? It's immobilization. This is why we use autologous bone blocks. We attach them to the bone. We screw them to the bone, they are immobilized, and this is why they work. Not because there is some magic autologous cells that, um, that promote the bone growth. No, that's not the truth. Simply because there is the perfect immobilization. Now we speak about xeno and synthetic rats. Once again, the answer is also no. Because what we can see here, we have a um, uh, experimental setup. It was made by Professor Schmidling in Zurich. It was published back in 2013. So they made a comparison. What if I have a critical size defect like this here? Critical size defect is any defect that is larger than five to six millimeters. Then they stuffed some bone graft material, xenogenic bone graft material in one of the sides. In the other side, they, lift, uh, they left it empty. And then they used this self-hardening bone graft material. 
So what they found out in the histology after four weeks was simply that the material that were loose granules, the uh, xenogenic uh, bovine bone graft material, mm, yeah, you were able to see some uh, bone regeneration. But once you use a bone graft material, in this case, a synthetic bone graft material, the self-hardening bone graft material, easy graft, you, you've seen a much improved bone regeneration. Not because easy graft is a magic material, it's simply because it resembles an autologous bone block. It's self-hardening, you can mold it to the side, it's fully immobilized, that means all the action transferred by muscles and by the tongue, by eating, by speaking, transferred to the site where the bone should regenerate, is simply immobilized, like the autologous bone graft that we screw to the site. If you have loose granules, of course, there is immobility, and the output of bone regeneration is much less. Here you can see the histology after 16 weeks, here you can see the newly formed bone, but this is also important. Once again, the, the, the uh, graft material is not turned into bone. It is also integrated. Here you can see the difference between the empty socket, because of course, if, there, if, if you have a critical size defect, then of course, bone regeneration is very, very slow, and you will have no full bone regeneration because the, the defect size is too big. You can see with the uh, bovine xenograph, you can see some kind of bone regeneration, but the best output you always have when you have an immobilized site. You can see the slight violet parts here. This is all the newly formed bone after 16 weeks that is also integrating the bone graft material. So this is once again the histology after 16 weeks. You can see the experimental side. You can see it in, in different enlargements here. And all these materials are also integrated. But since these materials, we have two versions of this uh, self-hardening biphasic um, uh, bone graft material. There is the monophasic one, which simply contains beta-calcium phosphate. You have the other one that consists of 60% hydroxyapatite and 40% beta-calcium phosphate. You can see that the beta-tricalcium uh, phosphate is slowly resorbing and replaced by autologous bone. And so it's up to you then finally to decide if you want to have a fast resorption of the beta-tricalcium phosphate or if you want to have a more prolonged also integration of the bone graft material to achieve a better bone volume in the site. And what you can see here, the comparison between the monophasic and the biphasic uh, easy graph is simply that the output, the netto gain of newly formed bone is better when you use biomaterials that contain hydroxyapatite, which by the way is not a foreign body or a foreign material. All our long bones consist of hydroxyapatite because hydroxyapatite is built by nature and it's the basic mineral of uh, bone. Here you can see again the comparison between the different types of bone graft materials and the immobilization of the self-hardening easy graft material uh, results in much improved uh, bone gain and faster bone regeneration because the site is simply immobilized. <clears throat> now let's speak about two different things. First of all, we speak about bone regeneration with bone graft materials. Then we speak about implants. But is there a difference between an augmentation site and an implant that we later on insert into the augmented site or in native bone? No, because titanium is also a biocompatible material. It does not resorb because we don't need implants that resorb. We need them as long as possible for 20, 30, 40 years, but they also osteointegrate. Like autologous bone block grafts, like xenogenic bone block grafts, or like um, self-hardening biphasic or monophasic uh, self-hardening uh, biomaterials, they simply osteointegrate. So um, from the standpoint of the bone, you have a scaffold, 
you have some kind of biocompatible body inside, the bone by itself wants to heal. And when the bone heals, it integrates the, the material you put inside. That's the whole story. So within, I think now 15 minutes, I was explaining to you the entire story of how bone regeneration works. But let's go to the conclusions and let's go over to some cases. So basically, immobilization is the prerequisite for proper vascularization to enable osseointegration of bone graft materials and uh, implants. So what do we need for a successful bone regeneration? We need an immobilized bone graft. The immobilized bone graft then will be secondary vascularized. Then later on, we have the a collagenous fiber texture, and finally, it will mineralize. And this we use when we do um, alveolar rich preservation after tooth extraction. So once again, as a take home message, from the standpoint of the bone, it doesn't make a difference if you do a bone augmentation first and then later on insert an implant, or you just extract the tooth, insert an implant, if you have a buccal defect, you build it up with a self-hardening bone graft material. And of course, you will have the same result as in this procedure, but in a more predictive way and in a much faster time. So the fight between should we use autologous bone or should we use a new modern state-of-the-art bone graft materials is clearly in favor of the bone graft materials because there is no advantage of using of the largest bone blocks anymore, since we have the self-hardening bone graft material. Now, let's quickly get to the indications where we can use this new type of bone graft material, the self-hardening bone graft material, easy graft. It's very simple. It's when we do episectomy, cysts, it's every time we have a critical size defect. When we want to do alveolar ridge preservation, when we have a periodontal surgery and we have to reconstruct the alveolar bone, or if we really have to reconstruct the entire alveolar ridge. Just to give you now step by step some ideas where you can use it, not every time you want to insert an implant because there are patients that don't have the money or that might reject the treatment with implants. In this case, we had to remove uh, some teeth, of course, uh, the teeth were compromised, the buccal bone was compromised, so we reconstructed the alveolar crest simply with the self-hardening bone graft material. You can see here, easy graft was placed inside the cavities. And this is then the prosthetic treatment after one week. And we perfectly know that due to healing process resorption, there might be then in the areas where we have the pontix that we have bone recessions and then we have gaps between the bridge and uh, the, the newly inserted bridge. But what you can see here is an x-ray after three years. You see there is no resorption at all because the bone was stabilized, the ridge was preserved with the self-hardening bone graft material. This is the clinical situation after three years, no difference to the time when we inserted, and this is an x-ray after 10 years. Once again, you don't see any difference to the original situation. And this is the clinical situation after 10 years. Of course, you can see the patient didn't clean too good, so we have some kind of uh, light gingivitis. Let's get to another example, like periodontal surgery. So what you can see here is a big periodontal defect. The patient, of course, has some periodontal problems, so there is a constant uh, conservative treatment of the periodontitis, but defects like this cannot be treated with conservative methods anymore. So what did we do? We just uh, reconstructed the alveolar crest around this tooth with the self-hardening easy graft. In this case, it was the small granule size. This is the situation six weeks after the surgery. This is the situation six months after surgery. You can see there is almost no loss in height and width of the bone. And this is the follow-up two years after surgery four years after surgery, and this is then the clinical situation of the tooth, and the patient is still happy to still bite with his tooth. 
And this is then the situation 10 years after surgery. Of course, we have some kind of vertical loss here, but the bone is still stable and the tooth is still stable. So patient is happy with this and it was a very, very small surgery. So periodontal defect reconstruction. Um, in this case, unfortunately, at the end, the patient rejected to have an implant inserted, but I can show you how you will have to proceed when you do a reconstruction of a periodontal defect like this. So this is the close-up. This is then the clinical situation after the uh, extra after the extraction, well, extraction, just picking out the tooth and the cleaning of the alveolar socket. This is extremely important to have a thorough cleaning. This is then the situation when the defect was reconstructed with EasyGraft. I, in most of the cases, I use EasyGraft crystal. This is then the follow-up directly after surgery. You see a little bit overstuffed here, but two weeks after the surgery, of course, uh, it gets to the same level as the adjacent bone. So I personally never overfill the site because I don't have the experience that I can gain more bone um, compared to the adjacent bone levels. This is then the situation, the clinical situation after two weeks. You see, I left it open, there were no sutures, and by secondary epithelization, the whole site will be covered by itself. And then the follow-up two years after surgery and nine years after surgery, and here the clinical situation nine years after surgery. Of course, maybe the patient will come back once and then we will get the implant inserted. But in some cases, then finally, the patient still opts in for an implant, so we have almost the same situation we experienced in the case before. Pre-surgical situation, the tooth completely loose. So you can see here the close-up of the site. This is then the extraction of the tooth, let's say tooth removal, the cleaning of the adjacent bone, because you cannot call this alveolar anymore, the insertion of EasyGraph crystal. As I told you, I almost every time use EasyGraph crystal. And I try it every time. I overfill the site, but at the end, you can see what is left over is exactly in the level of the bone. So I personally can only tell you, I have experienced that overfilling the site with easy graft um, doesn't result in a higher bone. This is then the clinical situation two weeks after surgery. You see the whole site is covered by secondary intention. So once again, no sutures. And this is the clinical situation four months after surgery. You see a nice level bone. You still can see the granules because the granules are also integrated. And then, of course, this patient really needed to have the implant very fast. And when you open the site, contrary to autologous bone and contrary to some other bone graft materials, of course, you will still see white granules because these white granules of the easy graft material are also integrated. So it's not a sign that bone regeneration didn't work, and I will prove to you now with some histologies. So what, we, what did we do? We just started to drill with a trocar. We removed this bone cylinder. You can see here the, uh, the site where the implant then later on will be inserted. And this is the histologic specimen. What you can see here is still the granules of the easy graft material, but within the granules, we have all new regenerated bone. So afterwards, of course, then the implant was inserted. You can see here also integrated uh, granules. Then we had the wound closure here uh, of the flap. And this is then the situation four months after inserting the implant, reopening of the site by a punch procedure, um, um, attaching the, the attachment and then inserting the crown. This is then the situation with the prosthetic treatment, uh, the x-ray with the prosthetic treatment, here the follow-up after two years, after nine years, and this is nine years after surgery. So once again, patient is happy, we have stable bone, and you can still see since this uh, site was reconstructed with hydroxyl epitype containing material. It's even more dense. And this is what I like. I like a more stable 
biomechanical stable bone to sustain the forces introduced by the implant than the natural bone, which is also very important in the maxilla. So tooth removal and immediate implant insertion, of course, we always have discrepancies between the geometry of the root and the inserted implant. So after extraction of the tooth, we in immediately insert the implant. It was the first premolar. So the implant always have to be inserted in the palatal, um, 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 in the palatal alveolar. And of course, we want to keep the alveolar rich in its original dimension. So this is why then we plug some easy graft crystal to the side. And this is then uh, the treatment with the provisional crown. This is the post-surgical x-ray. You can see here the provisional crown. Later on, after three weeks, you can see complete secondary epitalization. You still see some granules in the, in the epithelium. Then after three months, there was the prosthetic treatment. Once again, you can see there is no collapse of the uh, buccal alveolar ridge. And this is then the situation when the new crowns were inserted. And the follow-up, two years after surgery, stable bone, 10 years after surgery, stable bone, and also the buccal aspect of the alveolar crest was completely kept due to the hydroxyapatite containing self-hardening bone graft material, easy graft. So unfortunately, it took me a little bit longer. I hope Ingmar is not uh, too angry about me, but it's so important to understand how bone regeneration works and why the old method with autologous bone grafts can now be replaced by a more modern uh, method because the self-hardening bone graft material has the same biological properties like an autologous bone graft due to its immobilization in the augmentation site. Thank you for watching me and I'm now open for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Jordan, um, for these insights uh, on the bone uh, biology, which actually, actually it's everything back to bone and back to biology, back, back to the principles of biology that we need to use to get a good bone repair. So we do have a few questions, but yes. I think that um, the, the one that are about easy graft, the bone graft substitute that you use. So I believe that Mr. Ingmar Kupferer, who is going to present uh, the product features may answer some of these uh, questions already. Okay. So just uh, to present Mr. Ingmar Kupfer, he's the sales manager of the uh, Exco countries for, for, for Sunstar. So uh, Ingmar, the mic is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rachel. Let me share the screen and let's see how quick that works. Okay. It says screen sharing has been started. So let's wait a second. Here we are. So you can all see the EasyGraph crown page. Yes, but it's not in full screen. Okay. Let me see. You have to click on start presentation. Yeah. Right up here. We had the same issue yesterday. Let me see if this works. Okay. That's all good now. Opening. It's good now. Excellent. Okay. Let's have a look into uh, Easy Graft. Uh, it's a purely synthetic bone graft, uh, soft from the syringe. It hardens in the defect. What you do see here, this stickiness is reality. We will show you in a second. You have seen some of it already. You apply Easy Graft directly from the syringe into the defect. It becomes a moldable mass and it hardens in C2 into in contact with blood within minutes. And that makes it a stable, but still highly, highly porous uh, scaffold. So here is an X-ray of an easy graft granule. You have seen the picture already with Dr. Angelo. Here you see the very thin polyelectite layer, the so PLGA layer. That layer will be activated with a liquid. We call it biolinker. This comes together. The syringe with the bone craft material and the biolinker comes together. You mix 
the biolinker into the syringe and this activates the coating, makes it sticky. So as you see here, this is the activated material. And here you see the X-ray of the in situ material. The picture, the X-ray and in the X-ray, you see the macro porosity. You know that you need some micro porosity as you see it here and the macro porosity for bone formation. How does it work? Um, you open the syringe from the top, you add the biolinker, you put the plunger on top again, move uh, the plungers forth and back, let's say something around one to three times. Uh, once this is done, you activated all the, all the granules, you get rid of the excess uh, uh, liquid, you don't need it anymore, you use any sterile tissue in your clinic, you apply easy graft from the syringe into the defect and you condense it well. Um, so here we have an overview of a couple of indications. I don't need to go into detail as you've seen it with Dr. Rangelo already. We have two different materials. One we call it easy graft crystal. This is like all easy grafts, purely synthetic uh, of, pure, of purely synthetic origin. It's a BCP, a biphasic calcium phosphate, which means it consists to 60% of HA and 40% beta TCP beta tricalcium phosphate. The hydroxybutite is a mineral like a rock. It has a very slow degradation. That means hydroxybutite remains incorporated in the newly formed bone for long-term volume stability. We have another product. We call it Easy Graph Classic. Again, purely synthetic origin. This is a phase pure beta TCP which means it completely degrades into patient's own bone in five to 15 months. Here, we talk about resorption of the bone graft. We do not talk about a recommendation of when to implant. This offers more space for new bone. What does that mean? This is a study uh, which was done with rabbits uh, and each rabbit received a sinus lift and both sides have been treated one side with easy graft crystal the so one with a beta TCP and HA, and one side with Easy Graph Classic pure beta TCP. The outcome was after sacrificing is um, that both sides experienced bone growth, whereas the beta TCP, the pure beta TCP side, had lots and much more new po bone, less rest granules because it's fully degrading. The easy graft crystal side with beta T, sorry, with hydroxybutite has less new, po new bone, also purple color, has more easy graft granules left simply because the HA is slowly degrading, but it has more bone volume. So the decision is do you want to have a purely degrading product or a slowly resorbing volume preserving product? Um, this is a basic overview. You will find lots of information, much more, including cases and video on our website, guido.com. If you have any question, feel free to contact us at contact at um, On the website, you will also find an overview uh, with all our distributors. You might even check the website. They are listed there or you ask us for the overview. And we recommend you follow our LinkedIn uh, page it's Sunstar Europe SA, where we do updates on, on topics uh, regularly. Let's have a look at the scientific evidence. Some of the studies have already been looked at. Uh, let's go a bit into more detail. Before we go into the studies, let me recommend you to have a look in our guidebook, uh, the, the Guide or Indication Guide Rich Preservation. It's a manual which was written by several uh, users, key users, including Dr. Angelo, uh, which includes also a decision tree and a step-by-step -step guide, plus many, many, many cases. So please contact us, order your free copy, Guidebook Rich Preservation, either you send an email to us or you contact your local distributor, or you comment one of our posts on LinkedIn and we will uh, happily, gladly send you a copy. So, rich preservation, what does it look like? Uh, scientific evidence. 
This is a study uh, from Leventis, uh, Dr. Leventis in uh, London. Um, they had a total of 10 patients treated with EasyGraft Classic, where they found um, after four months, bone biopsies were taken. The mean percentage of new bone was 25%, 24%, and remaining graft, 13%. That means after four months, you use a classic product, a fully resolvable product, you still expect to see granules. You see the histology here, this is a granule, that's another one, that's another one, which is bridged by immature bone and also that is newly formed bone. This study, if you want to take a screenshot, it's a free download. If you are uh, looking for this study um, or you type in that number, you will have a free download. Or let us know and we will send you a copy. Here you see the socket preservation, um, an atraumatic extraction, fill in of easy graft. You see the hardened product. This is a hemostatic punch, it's not a membrane. In that case, under these conditions, it was a membrane free treatment, cross stitching to save the wound edges. And here you see one week after, after the operation, you still see a bit of the punch and uh, lots of uh, granules. <coughs> granules, sorry. This is surgical re-entry after four months. And you see very clearly here, you still see easy graft granules as Dr. Angelo also mentioned already. You don't need to be scared. You will still see granules for up to 15 months simply because the bone formation is still running. Easy graft crystal. Uh, we have another study from Dr. Kakar from India. Um, who had 15 patients with easy graft crystal and um, at re-entry after 5.2 months, they found new bone 21%, remaining graft granules 26%. That is because easy graft crystal is because of the HA slower resorbing. So with easy graft crystal, you will find white granules at re-entry for a much longer time, whereas you have a higher volume preservation. Here we have a study from uh, Dr. Jurisic from University of Belgrade. Uh, they, you, they treated five patients uh, with Easy Graft uh, Classic. After four months, they took uh, bone samples and made the histologies. And here you see very nicely, that is an Easy Graft granule, all the green, is osteoid layer, immature bone, and all the red color you see here, all the red here is new mineralized bone. That means here re-entry was at four months. That means when you open, when you re-enter, you see white granules, no worries, bone formation is running. You see this is the natural process. This is a magnification. Here you see the granules which are bridged by osteoid layer. The red is new mineralized hard bone. Um, we have another study, uh, Dr. Angelo mentioned it already, uh, uh, from Professor Schmidlin in Zurich. This is freshly inserted rabbit skull. Here you see freshly inserted bovine bone. This is easy graft classic, easy graft crystal. That's an empty cavity as a control group. And you see very nicely that when you use bovine bone, it looks like bone simply because it is cow bone. And when you re-enter after, let's say three, four months, this picture looks very similar. And very often users say, well, when I use bovine bone, I re-end after three, four months, everything I see is bone. And yes, that's correct. Everything you see is bone. This is pretty true. Whereas you cannot identify how much is new patient bone and how much is rest bovine bone. With synthetics, all the synthetics are the same. All, all the synthetics are white granules. With synthetics, you will always see for a certain period white granules. That's the main visibility difference. No need to be scared, as we have seen with the studies mentioned, the bone formation process is running. And even when you see white granules, no need to be scared. The bone, uh, the bone formation is an ongoing process and um, um, you will have a similar bone formation as with bovine bone. Simply, you see white granules instead of this bovine bone. Okay, so that was my quick, uh, uh, quick summary. To, to be a bit in time.
Thank you very much, Ingma, for the presentation of the product features. So we do have a, a few questions. I know that Dr. Trona already answered some of them, but to be sure that our participants can benefit from all the answers, I will just you know, go through them and probably uh, they, they already have the answer, but still. The first one is... Well, which Rachel, yes? may I interrupt you shortly? Of course. I have opened the Zoom webinar chat and I can see some of the questions. Maybe I can answer them directly. Perfect. Okay. Yes. So, there was one question from Dr. Shamir uh, Kotter uh, asking which material resolves faster, TCP or hydroxyapatite? Actually, hydroxyapatite is very slow resolving, and this is why I personally prefer to use hydroxyapatite because, um, as it was also repeated by Ingmar uh, in the study of Professor Schmidlin, the the, the highest amount of, uh, um, of regenerated bone, you always achieve with, it, with hydroxyapatite. Why? Because hydroxyapatite is already part of our body. TCP, um, you will use when you need a very fast resorption. But fast resorption doesn't mean that already after three months, there will be no particles of uh, TCP visible anymore. This also takes sometimes a lot of months depending on the size of the regenerating area. And when we're speaking about bone regeneration, uh, if, we have, if you have a small extraction socket, of course, maybe after three or four months, if you do histology, a biopsy, you won't see any granules material left. But if you have a real big augmentation of the size of two or three sockets or superior total technique or sinus lead, even there you will find after one year some granules of TCP but they will be already almost fully resorbed. With hydroxyapatite, sometimes after five, six, seven years, you can still see the particles because they are giving stability to the bone. And it's the same hydroxyapatite that also rests in the long bones and that is not degraded and rebuilt anymore because also the hydroxy hydroxyapatite that is produced by our own body stays there for a very long time. Always keep in mind the natural turnover of all the bones in our body is approximately between seven to nine years. That means after, if you take a look at your, of, uh, of your shin bone, for instance, and you look at it again after nine years, this is a new bone. But in the meanwhile, there are very, very slow resorption processes and rebuilding processes. I hope this answers my quest, uh, the, the question of Dr. Kilo. Then, the next question I can see here is, does easy graft get replaced by new bone or just gets integrated with bone? And what about the vitality of the grafted area? This was another question of Dr. Koppe. So, in the first step, in the first three months, uh, the bone graft material is also integrated. In case we use better TCP, already about 20 to 25% are resorbed and replaced by new bone. In case of uh, hydroxyapatite containing bone graft material, of course, the amount of visible, in, in histology visible hydroxyapatite granules will be much higher. It will be around, after three months, it will be around 90%. But, and this is the important part, and I don't know if INMA can provide maybe some of the pictures. Um, I think it was in January this year that Professor Engelke, a very famous uh, maxillofacial surgeon in Germany from the University of Göttingen, answered your question exactly. So what did uh, Professor Engelke do? He just drilled um, um, precise holes into the bone in an uh, animal experimental setup. And then he left one of these drill holes open, like um, the same way in the study of Professor Schmidlin comparing the different bone graft materials. And in the other socket or in the other drill hole, he put easy graft uh, crystal and easy graft classic, better GCP, et cetera. And then instead of doing histology, he let it heal for about three to four months and then he was drilling into the site again. And instead of doing a histology, he was filming with an endoscope. 
and with a, uh, with a certain ma matrix, he was calculating the vascularization. And astonishingly, compared to the uh, drill hole where nothing was filled in, he found out that vascularization was much higher in the site where he inserted the easy graft. This was very, very astonishing. And if you have a chance, maybe um, um, Inma or Rachel could provide this publication or some of these pictures to you. It's really fascinating because this is a result we never expected that we have a higher vascularization of the reconstructed site than if we don't put in anything. So we will have to repeat now this study, maybe in a human study, where we have big extraction sockets with defects, and then some of the defects we don't fill in anything, we let it deal by natural procedures, or we fill in isograph and isograph crystal, and then <clears throat> after three to four months, we just do the same what Professor Engel did, and we film it with the endoscope to count the number of blood vessels that are crossing the site. So very astonishing uh, result. It was published, so it should be available online if you do a research on Google Scholar. Maybe it's open access, I don't know. We, we can definitely see that and provide that. Uh, with just Dr. Kello, send us uh, a short email in, at contact at guido.com and then we can see what we can provide. Okay, uh, that would be good. So the other question, Dr. Trudan, that we have here, and maybe we can just have a short answer because other, other, we have already um, gone yeah, from beyond, beyond time. So can easy graph be used in sinus augmentation? Yes, definitely. Because um, in a lot of cases, uh, we know from, from literature that in about 20 to 30% of the cases, you will have a puncture or a rupture of the sinus membrane. So not to abort the sinus, um, the sinus lift procedure. Um, commonly, we use um, collagenous membranes or polylactic membranes to cover the rupture, and then we push in the granulate bone graft material. In case something like this happens, um, easy graft is really a life savior because you just push in easy graft, and easy graft is covered with the polylactic membrane, and this. Uh, bone block like uh, bone graft material that exactly fits to the sinus floor closes this rupture. Of course, it's, if, it's, if it's a complete rupture, it won't save anything because then also this bone block like material will pop into the nose and be sneezed out. But if it's a small rupture of one or two centimeters, you just put in easy graft, you don't need any membrane, and then you will have for sure a good result. Of course, you don't have to overstuff it. Um, in case there is no rupture of the sinus membrane, it's up to you to decide whether you want to take a simple granulate material or if you use easy graft. But the application of easy graft, to tell you the truth, is much more safe because if you put in the granules, you have to stuff them to the palatal side. And sometimes the stuffing is not hard enough. Instead, if you use the syringe and you push in the easy graft, you can be 100% sure that also on the palatal side of the sinus cavity, under the elevated Schneiderian membrane, there will be sufficient amount of bone graft to, uh, for the bone, uh, for the for proper bone regeneration and later implant insertion. And there was also one last question, I think it was the last question. What about using a membrane to cover easy graft in damaged extraction okay, sites? Yes. So, in case, you really have a complete destroyed site. I mean, remember the cases I presented to you, we had the real big periodontal defects. In these cases, I never ever put any uh, membrane because uh, easy graft by the coverage of the polylactic membrane has an integrated membrane. Only in case this site, the periosteum of the site is really completely destroyed, then of course you have no remineralization because there is no periosteum. So in case the periosteum is destroyed, of course, also with easy graft, you will have to place a membrane. But you can always simply check. The, peri the intact periosteum is silvery shining. It looks like a fish belly. If this is not present, then you have no periosteum, you have no pre-osteoblasts that are delivering 
for a mineral addition, then you will have to place a member. Thank you, Dr. Trodan, for all these answers. And thank you all for your questions. I think we have answered them all. So it's time for us to close this session because we, have, we are a little bit over time, but it was so interesting and all the questions were keeping coming. So thank you very much, everyone. On behalf of SENSA, um, thank you, Dr. Trodan, of course, for your time with us. And thank, thank you to all the participants for your time spending spent with us today. So do not forget that we have two upcoming webinars uh, next week with Dr. Luigi Canolo on uh, rich preservation in the uh, aesthetic area. And then uh, that, will, that will be on the July 14th. And on July 21st, we will have the third and last guide webinar on rich preservation on the keys to success uh, in rich preservation. So thank you again very much for your time with us. And um, with that, I will say, I see you next week then. Thank, thank you, you for the moderation, and Rachel. Rachel. And thank, thank you, Rachel. Rachel. Thank you, Angelo. Greetings from Austria. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.